everyone. Welcome to the July 18th edition of the Timeform US Pacecast. I'm David Aragona here with my usual co-host Craig Mulkowski, and we are looking back at this last weekend racing from around the country, though primarily focusing on upstate New York and Saratoga Springs, where they began the Saratoga race meet last week. Opening day was Thursday. Stakes racing every one of the first four days of this opening week, of course, with grade one action on Saturday in the Diana. We'll recap racing at all levels from Saratoga during the past week. We'll discuss the stakes races, some of the two-year-olds, maiden races that are worth mentioning that got decent speed figures. So that'll be the bulk of this show, but we will discuss a few other venues. Monmouth Park, they ran a couple of stakes races last week. We'll discuss one of them, actually a race that came off the turf, as well as a big speed figure allowance race, a couple of turf stakes from Laurel to mention, and then we'll wrap things up at Woodbine, where they ran two stakes races for the two-year-olds on the Tapita surface. But Craig, like I was saying at the top, and as we were discussing offline before I hit record, most of the action from this past week and most of the focus of the racing world was on Saratoga. Yeah, it seems like things have changed. I always seem to remember in the past, Del Mar started a little bit before Saratoga, but times have changed and Saratoga starts a little earlier. We'll have a much fuller dance card next week with uh, Del Mar kicking in for sure. Yeah, that's definite. Uh, Other big days coming up. Haskell on Saturday. I'm sure we'll discuss all of that in a little bit. Uh, But uh, the racing calendar is definitely going to pick up as we get into the second half of July. But let's talk about this opening week at Saratoga. Uh, We had, like I said, a slate of stakes races every single day. The feature race on Saturday where they ran three graded stakes was the Grade 1 Diana. It's become kind of the traditional opening weekend uh, feature race uh, for that uh, first Saturday card, and as has been the case in recent years, this one dominated by Chad Brown entries. Uh, the second year in a row, I believe, that he had four runners entered in the Diana, and this year it was four out of the five entrants. And you know, Craig, there was a lot of griping about the fact that you know Chad Brown had just basically comprised most of the field in this race. Uh, people hate to see the same trainer sending out multiple runners or most of the runners in these Grade One events. But the one thing I will say about when Chad Brown has these horses is it does seem like he generally lets the jockeys and the horses kind of sort themselves out on the racetrack. It doesn't often feel like the results are predetermined when he sends out multiple entries in this race. That's not to say that we wouldn't like to see more diversity among the barns. Yeah, it's certainly not ideal to have one trainer have four out of five runners. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but you can't really blame Chad Brown. He's running in the races and you know, it would have been really easy to to not enter some of his other horses and just run in Italian and get the easy win for a horse who almost won the Eclipse Award last year. He doesn't do that. He's not afraid to race his horses against each other. So if you have complaints about it, they shouldn't be with, with him. Uh, other than he just has an embarrassment of riches in, in the division. So um, in this case, one of his other other horses won the race, White Beam, a horse I know you liked. I saw she was one of your selections of the day. And it's not like when you looked on paper at this race that in Italian had some gigantic edge over some of the other rivals in here. There were horses that were certainly looked like they could be competitive on paper. And only thing I think maybe the going hurt in Italian a little bit because she set a pretty solid pace. When you look at the pace figures, none of them were coated in red, but they were all in the 130s. Uh, and she just didn't quite have that finish that she normally does, even when she sets a fast pace. Uh, taking nothing away from White Beam, who ran what was a career best race. She was coming off a 119 speed figure. Uh uh, ran a 124 here, and I agreed with your argument that 119 last time. She probably ran better than that uh, with the circumstances of that race. So I thought both of the top two ran very, very well, and it was just a nose apart on the wire. Even the third place finisher, Fev Rover, the non Chad Brown horse, ran a very good race. It, it was an exciting one for so early on the card in just the five horse field. Yeah, I mean, I got a couple points to make about this race. I mean, we'll start with an Italian, I guess. I mean, I I think the thing to really remember about her is that 
she probably is more of a miler at heart. Uh, that's her best distance. And they've stretched her out a couple times and she's been successful. She obviously won the Diana in 2022. But like you were getting at, different turf course this year. I mean, they went over three seconds slower than the time that she ran when she won the Diana in 2022. That was a rock hard turf course that can sometimes carry a horse maybe an extra furlong beyond their ideal distance. So she got the mile and an eighth that day. Um, she probably won was the best horse in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf last year, but a mile and three sixteenths is obviously pushing her a little bit past her limit. And I just think she's a horse that probably really appreciates the flat mile. And maybe that's something Chad Brown's going to have to make some de decisions about as they move on to the Breeders' Cup this year, because she obviously is a horse that belongs in the Breeders' Cup. They have to decide what is the right race for her. But I think we kind of saw her stamina exposed a little bit here as Flavian Pratt did not just settle for second on white beam. I really did like the the ride as he attacked Irad Ortiz on an Italian coming to the quarter pole. Um, didn't let that one just get away with those soft fractions that they did ratchet up the pressure in the second half of this race. And in the latter stages, it kind of just turned into uh, a test of will to the wire and White Beam was just able to get her nose down on the finish first. And I think the thing we have to remember about Chad Brown running horses in the Diana is that he's got a lot of contenders for this race. He had more than four horses that arguably could have been in this Diana field and the fact that he selected these four means that they were the ones that were doing well and White Beam was the one that had the least amount of accomplishments coming into this race but the fact that she was even entered here probably meant that she was really thriving and into this one. Chad Brown thought she had some upside and that proved to be the case she was kind of the in Italian of this year as in Italian was the biggest price of the Chad Brown quartet when she won the Diana last year. This year it was White Beam and they both ran really well uh, Fev Rover, who was third, also a good effort for Mark Cassie. He was the one trainer that was willing to take take on this Chad Brown juggernaut. And uh, Fev Rover loses nothing at the feet. She only lost this race by less than a length. Uh, definitely proved that her big effort uh, starting off her season at Woodbine last time was no fluke at all. I oh, definitely agree. I uh, don't have a whole lot more to add about this one. I agree about the mile for an Italian. Uh, I haven't looked to see what the Philly and Mare turf is going to be run at this year, but I think it's a mile and a quarter at Santa Anita. So maybe the mile is the right direction to go. Let's move on to some other turf stakes uh, from that Saturday card. One other was the Grade 3 Kelso run later in the day. And uh, the big two squared off in here, Casa Creed and Annapolis. And Casa Creed was able to get the pace set up that he needed, but also the ride that Luis Saez gave him, who just basically piloted this horse like he knew he was best, wasn't afraid to move early to go wide around the second turn. And Casa Creed struck the lead, what some people might think was a little early at the top of the stretch, but he still was able to hold off Annapolis, who was just second best on the day. I would agree with that. Annapolis was second best because Casa Creed, I mean, it was a good ride by Luis Saez because he was aggressive and he won. But I wouldn't say it was a perfect trip because of all the ground loss. There was definitely some on both turns by Casa Creed. It didn't seem to matter, though. He's a horse who I know we talked about on the forecast. We both thought that he is just as good as a, at a mile as he is sprinting, and he showed that here. He ran a 126 time form U.S. speed figure, uh, 124 for Annapolis, and it's kind of hard to find any excuse for Annapolis. He was just beaten by a horse who was better on the day, and no knocks on him. He ran a good race, just ran into a horse that was a, a little bit better. Yeah, it was a little surprising to see Casa Creed actually ahead of Annapolis when they arrived at the half-mile pole. Annapolis was trying to save ground covered up, whereas Luis Saez was out in the clear getting that uncovered trip, but that allowed him to make the first move, and I think that proved to be decisive at Saratoga on Saturday. Again, we're talking about a turf course that had a little bit of give in it. Um, I think the inner turf course might have had even a little more give than the melon turf course, as I'm looking at the Time Form US P uh, charts. Seems like we rated the inner turf course a 6 on a 1 to 10 scale on our track condition ratings in Time Form US, and Craig, that's generally a, a rating that we give more to a good turf course than a firm turf course, is that right? Yes, I would say that was definitely more of a good type force. Uh, I haven't really seen him ever use different conditions at Saratoga, just going from memory. So maybe it's one they, they always rate him the same. I'm not sure about that. But there, there was a noticeable difference in the track variant between the two. Even though it's just one point on our rating. I mean, those ratings are a pretty big scope. 
Yeah, they will sometimes rate one course a certain rating and another course a different one, but it's rare. And uh, there's a lot of latitude for what constitutes a firm turf course these days, which is one reason why uh, those track condition ratings that Craig put in the Timeform US uh, PPs in the charts are so helpful when you're determining how a course was actually playing on uh, one of these days where there was precipitation. Um, and Greg, just a shout out to you. I think you gave out the cold trifecta on our stakes preview last week when you had English B in this third slot. He did finish third in this uh, uh, grade three Kelso as the biggest price on the board at 31 to one. Yeah, I didn't get a whole lot right on the forecast, but I played this one vertically and it did did well. It actually paid more than I thought it would in the, the trifecta. So, yeah, that one worked out pretty well. Good ground saving trip by um, John Velasquez. The final stakes race they ran on that Saturday card at Saratoga was the Grade 3 Sanford. And, you know, Craig, some two ways to look at the runner-up gold sweep in this race. And I think he's kind of where we have to start the conversation. He was the 1-5 to favorite. Basically, everybody expected him to win this race fairly easily, just given the speed figure advantage with which he came into this race. And he obviously had some trouble. I mean, stumbling as badly as he did at the start and then being behind runners. But when I watch his trip, more so than the start being a problem for him, I thought it was the middle portion of the race that really caused him to lose this one because he didn't react very well to that kickback at Saratoga, which sometimes can be pretty intense, especially for a young horse. And he was unable to move up at that critical juncture around the far turn. And just, you know, once he finally got into the clear in the stretch, it just seemed like the stumble combined with throwing his head about being unsettled behind all that kickback, it just eventually took its toll on this horse. Um, I still would have liked to see him win this race, though, just given how slow it came back. I kind of agree with that. I mean, it's it's hard to put a number on the kind of trouble he had, even if you were just looking at the start. Um, You know, it's some people may want to read it numerically. I'm not sure how you do that. I've tried various things over the years. But one thing I would say for sure is it probably didn't cost him 20 points or 25 points, however much he regressed from his last race. So I, I'm i a little more down on him than I was coming uh, into the race. Obviously, I was high on him, but I'm not willing to forgive the race as much as some others, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I know you made the point that maybe you could change your mind because like Forte disappointed last year and you picked him next time out and he came back to win. And that's all good. The difference is Forte was going to be overlooked at the windows because there wasn't these visible excuses like Gold Sweep had. And I would imagine Gold Sweep is going to get bet very, very heavily next time. And I would be very leery of doing that or leaning on him because I, I just wasn't very impressed despite the trouble. I just didn't see that same athletic ability we saw from him in his second race. Yeah, one difference I will point out between uh, this year's Sanford and last year's Sanford when I kind of revised my opinion on Forte and ended up liking him a little bit out of that race is last year, opening week at Saratoga, some might remember, the track was pretty speed favoring. I mean, there was the same kickback situation, but horses were really having trouble running through it at multiple levels, and we saw a lot of races being dominated towards the front end. I didn't get that same sense watching opening week at Saratoga this year. Maybe the fact that we had some precipitation on Friday and Sunday, um, you know, opened it up a little bit and, uh, you know, the track just played a little more fairly. Uh, But I I thought the gold sweep should have had more of a late kick just given the way the races were playing around him uh, as opposed to Forte, who was actually closing through the kickback uh, in the race last year and ran a little bit better than maybe I gave him credit for at first glance. Um, As for the horse that won the race, Yo-Yo Candy, I mean, it's kind of plainly apparent that he turned the tables on Gold Sweep. He was beaten 10 lengths by that rival in the Tremont, um, came back and Yo-Yo Candy basically ran to the same level as last time. It was just that Gold Sweep took that big step backwards and, you know, nobody else in this field really showed up and we kind of talked about it. This was just not a Sanford field with much depth beyond Gold Sweep. So um, not a big surprise that the speed figure came back relatively disappointing. No, yeah, we hadn't mentioned that. Yo-Yo Candy ran an 89 here, which is actually a point less than when he was a distant third to Gold Sweep last time and 84 for Gold Sweep. 
Uh, even the third place finisher Dickens regressed a bit from a 95 in his debut win, but that I kind of take with a grain of salt because that 95 was in a four and a half furlong race. He was stretching out a furlong and a half here. All the others in behind kind of improved or ran the same. So uh, there were plenty other sprints on the card. The track was fast all day. So it was a relatively easy speed figure to make. The other two-year-old stakes that they ran last week, the traditional opening day feature at Saratoga was the Grade 3 Schuylerville, this one for the two-year-old Phillies. And another big upset here, a 46-to-1 winner of the Sanford, and here a 21-to-1 winner of the Schuylerville in the first-time starter, Becky's Joker. Gary Contessa took a shot to running a first-time starter against this stakes field, and when he explained his logic in the winner's circle afterwards, it kind of made sense that a lot of these horses that have have already won a race aren't really running that much faster than a lot of the horses that we're going to see in the maiden races at Saratoga. So we thought, why not just take a shot in this stakes race? And it certainly worked out for Becky's Joker. Uh, it did for sure. You could even see it on this day. We're going to talk about a maiden race earlier on the card that went faster. And when you look at the speed figures coming in, the only horse who had run above a 90 was Wine on Tappa, uh, who wound up going off the even money favorite. Uh, she had a little trouble early, a wide trip, regressed a bit, and... Everybody else actually improved their speed figures a little bit, but it just wasn't a very strong field, and the first-time starter was able to take advantage. He ran a 93 time form U.S. Uh, figure. That one's upgraded about six points because of the really fast pace, which she somewhat took advantage. It's not like she was way behind. She was only a length behind or so, but she was in mid-pack, so she still gets some of that upgrade since she was so close up, and... Just, yeah, it's not a race I'm going to get overly excited about because, as you said, we're going to see many maiden races with faster speed figures. Yeah, I mean, this really did some nice things. I mean, when you watch it back, she actually broke about a length slowly in this race, had to rush up on the backstretch to get into that position, stalking in behind the leaders, and then made a second move to take over at the top of the stretch. So there's no doubt that she was best on the day. Uh, this was a, a nice professional performance from a two-year-old filly, aside from the fact that she broke slowly. And uh, she just seemed like she had more natural ability than the rest of this field. Um, you know, you mentioned wine on tap. I kind of noted it in my analysis for this race that, the 93 that she came out of in her debut, you're not the only one that had that a fast race. Seems highly suspect in retrospect. I think we've now had a couple of runbacks out of that race and both have regressed. Um, so that's one that I kind of want to keep an eye on. There's another horse running back out of that race, I believe, on Wednesday at Saratoga. So something to keep an eye on. Um, but uh, yeah, just just not the strongest Skylerville field overall. That's something that I think we've kind of grown accustomed to. These top two-year-olds get going later and later in the season as uh, the years progress. Uh, so we're probably not going to see some of the best two-year-olds on either coast until August rolls around. And uh, you'd imagine that horses like Becky's Joker and Yo-Yo Candy might be hard-pressed to win stakes races a little bit later in the Saratoga season. Let's move on to, as Craig mentioned, uh, some of the other two-year-old performances from the week, including a Thursday maiden race that took place before the Schuylerville, also for two-year-old fillies. That was won by Sugar High going out for the Bill Mott Barn, a first-time starter. And this daughter of twirling candy, Craig, very professional for a first or broke alertly, stalked the pace, and really drew off well in the stretch, like one that's not going to mind a little added ground. Yeah, I was happy watching this. I'm actually friends with the owner, C.J. Johnson. Uh, so I, I can only imagine the thrill it must be to win a maiden special weight with a two-year-old at Saratoga. Uh, so props to him. And the horse ran well. She got a 99 time form U.S. speed figure, a 96 on final time. So a full nine points faster than what we saw in the stakes race. Now, granted, this was a half furlong shorter. So maybe that helps a little bit uh, bridge the gap, but just a good, solid, professional effort. Uh, we don't often see Bill Mott send out a lot of first-time starters. That that It's not his main goal, I think, but he does win when he has a good horse like this. 
Yeah, it seems like Bill Mott's sort of been tr- changing his profile over the past few years, or uh, maybe he just is getting better stock recently. Well, I mean, he definitely has uh, some of the top uh, owners out there getting uh, those uh, good horses from Godolphin. But as you said, Sugar High, um, a smaller owner. Uh, but uh, Bill Mott's had a lot of success with first-time starters over the past uh, you know few months and even the past few years. And if you look up the stats and formulator, he's actually one of the best first-time starter trainers that's going to be running two year olds in uh, these uh, races at Saratoga. Now, he hasn't always started the good ones this early at Saratoga. His stats with two-year-old first-time starters at Saratoga uh, leave a little bit to be desired, but maybe he's changing that profile, too, with the way that this filly ran. Um, And she definitely seems like one that could be a contender in either the Adirondack or the Spinaway a bit later in the meet. Saw another well-meant two-year-old on Saturday in the first race of the day. The Todd Pletcher-trained Pirate uh, had garnered a lot of hype coming into his debut. Uh, This is a son of Omaha Beach, who obviously has a big pedigree. He's a half-brother to Preakness winner National Treasure, as well as some other runners who uh, were fast on the racetrack, earned some big speed figures, and this one certainly delivered in the afternoon. Yes, he did. There was little doubt once the the race was underway that this horse was going to win. Uh, The horse who ran second Kind of ranged up on him a little bit, uh, just like the race we just talked about. It was a Wayne Lucas horse that ran second uh, in his second start. This one at, at pretty high odds as well. And Just Steel uh, just never really made much of a den. Uh, once he engaged, Pirate just kind of picked away from him, one as easy as, as could be. Uh, I was a little surprised the speed figure didn't come back super fast, but I, I don't know how much relevance that really has. He ran a 93 in this spot. Uh, still faster than the stakes race we already talked about. Uh, so good effort from him, and I would expect a bigger, better figure next time out, imagining he's going to try stakes company. Yeah, I mean, I was when they turned into the stretch and Irad really got into him, I was sort of expecting him to draw off by a bigger margin. I mean, not that winning by three lengths on debut was anything to sneeze at, but, you know, when these top pleasure horses are really hyped, sometimes you can see a huge performance on debut. And, you know, Pirate, he, he did what he had to do. Um, maybe I was expecting a little more just based on the amount of hype coming into the race. Uh, and like you said, it was just the first start. This one might be able to do better, but it's going to be stepping up to a much tougher spot next time likely when he tries stakes company in a race like the Saratoga special or the hopeful, uh, but uh, certainly a decent effort for a first time starter. Tom Pletcher had another maiden winner on Friday at Saratoga of the older variety. The three-year-old Dreamlike finally got the maiden diploma in his fourth career start. Dreamlike, of course, had uh, tried some stakes company in the Wood Memorial a bit earlier in the season. And coming off a bit of a layoff here, setting the sights a little lower against maiden special weight foes. And he just always looked like a winner of this race. Did I guess he loses his title of best maiden and, you know, outside of first time starters that we don't know about best maiden to have run in the country now that he broke it because he had topped the 110 mark in all three of his uh, starts on the time form U.S. scale. And he ran a career best here uh, running a 114 time form U.S. speed figure uh, winning as easily as could be. It was a race that didn't feature much of a pace. It was a little bit on the moderate to slow side. Uh, a couple of them, a couple of the fractions are coated in blue and some of that is because of how dreamlike ran off at the end and really uh padded that late uh final time speed figure all the way up to 116 so good strong effort by him and i would imagine he'll find his way to a stake maybe to curl and uh, would seem like a logical spot for him as it's for horses that haven't won a stakes race yet well, uh, the, the Curlin is being run on Friday. It's already drawn, so I don't think they can sneak him into the field. Uh, yeah, they run that the same week as the, or actually the now now the week before the Jim Dandy, uh, so a little bit earlier this year. But yeah, I mean, he he's a horse that uh, you know they could have trouble, you know getting him into some of those top three-year-old races, just given how late he's breaking his maiden. The Travers would be an awfully ambitious spot, and um, they probably want to set, set their sights a little bit lower and not be in a rush with this horse. He seems like one that could have a nice four-year-old campaign if they keep him around, and given the time of year at which he broke his maiden, that's probably more the direction that Todd Pletcher will be thinking. Yeah, that would that would make sense. I didn't realize the schedule had changed, but even if it was uh, Jim Dandy week, that would probably be too soon. But just a good, strong effort from him and certainly a horse who seems like he has stakes in his future. 
Yeah, and Friday, Craig, I would imagine, was sort of a difficult day to make speed figures. There was obviously uh, rain that arrived, uh, races taken off the turf, uh, the track profile changed throughout the day. Um, also, it seemed, and I, and I can see this looking at uh, the Time from US charts and sort of the changing track condition rating throughout the day on the dirt, um, that you know maybe you had to handle some of the two-turn races differently than the one-turn races. And you know, I think you had to make a decision when it comes to the Wilton State stakes uh race four uh which just had a four horse field and uh, another strong chad brown presence and his uh narrow second choice on the tote board randomized was the one that got the job done here but in terms of raw times this came up a crazy fast race for the mile um and you know if you play it straight this was a much faster race than dreamlike and i'm looking at the buyer speed figures they played it straight randomized uh on buyer got a figure that's 12 points higher than dreamlike um you know i i could see that you did it differently and I would imagine you did break it out one turn versus two turn and and I understand because Dreamlike had that body of work of fast figures and you know this Wilton field it's hard to know how good they really are yeah the Wilton was different uh what did help for me was that there were three of these uh with the Wilson shoot three one mile races and I actually treated those separately than I did even the one turn races they just see all seemed a lot faster uh there was some issues with the last race uh that day with some thought maybe there was some timing but it turned out they were just using some different kind of camera or something this was re- uh reported by the Equibase chart caller that something just looked off when he timed the races from video. But eventually it turned out that all the posted times were right. And there was just really no way to, for me, to merge those one mile races with either the uh, the one other one turns or the two turns. They just didn't seem to fit. So I just kind of broke them out and did it separately. All the other races are, are the same. And when I looked at those other one mile races, I was pretty happy with the figures. I, I don't really have much of an issue with them. Yeah, I, I don't really have an issue with the way you did it either. Um, and, and as for the winner of the Wilton, uh, out of the Wilson shoot, I kept trying not to confuse that, um, randomized, uh, you know, she's kind of been a horse that when she shows up, she's really good. Uh, we just were kind of waiting for confirmation of that big maiden score at Aqueduct from uh, back in the early spring. That was going the one mile distance. They tried an ambitious spot off the layoff in the acorn. And she got some class relief here. She's obviously a good horse based on this evidence, but she did get everything her own way on the front end. Yeah, this was a race that uh, she just kind of inherited the lead early, uh, wasn't challenged, ran away from the field. I mean, it was a race where she all the fractions were coated in blue. There just wasn't a, uh, a whole lot going on in the race other than a, a procession around there by randomized. Uh, she did get a little bit challenged lead, I guess, from just Catherine, but never really looked in doubt. I wound up, she got a 112 speed figure. Uh, the runner-up, just Catherine, even splitting the races out improved her speed figure by a solid 13 points so that was all all of that kind of went together and there's certainly figures that i'll monitor but for whatever reason it just seemed to me the one mile races were playing really quick yeah and uh just catherine a horse that i actually liked in this race and she really outran her odds to uh be second here well ahead of the rest of the field but just ran into a good one in a uh, randomized though uh her trainer is one that has had horses really outrun the odds, uh shipping a small string up north uh this year and watching some of those friday races it did feel like speed and the rail was especially dangerous so something to keep in mind moving forward and one more stakes race to discuss from Saratoga last week. That was the Sunday feature. The quick call grade three event uh, supposed to be going five and a half furlongs on the turf, but this one was rained off onto the main track. And one of the turf entrants, Uncashed, actually had plenty of dirt for him. He was going to be making his turf debut if the race had been run on the grass. But um, sir, sure, Larry Avelli wasn't too upset to see it come off the turf. And uh, he validated his strong form from the Midwest as he easily beat this field in fast time. He did. He ran a 113 time form US speed figure, which is right in line with the last two. He ran 112 the time before, 111 the time before that. He just, uh, ever since he came back from the layoff, he, he keeps running his race. He's a quick one. I don't want to get too excited about this one. There wasn't a whole lot of competition in here once the race came off turf, but he did exactly what he was supposed to do. He won and he won comfortably. 
Yeah, and got a bit of a pace downgrade here because he didn't have to set particularly fast fractions to make the front. But his 119 final time number, that's really solid for a three-year-old um, and kind of a, a bit of a progression on his recent form. So I'll be interested to see what they decide to do with him. Obviously, they had entered him for turf here, and I assume there was some intention to get him on the grass. I wonder if those plans will change now just based on how well he's running on the dirt. Um, feels like maybe targeting a graded stakes on the dirt that's scheduled for that surface might be um, a logical next step for him. Um, and also, I think he's a horse that can handle longer distances than five and a half furlongs just kind of based on the way that he runs. So it'll be interesting to see where Larry Ravelli decides to go with him for his next start. Let's move on to some other venues now. Uh, Monmouth Park saw a couple of big speed figures get registered last week, and we'll sort of talk about a similar situation to the quick call. Uh, as Monmouth kind of runs parallel stakes races to Saratoga um, on that opening weekend, uh, or as Saratoga runs that Coronation Cup, which we didn't talk about. That was another off-the-turf race. And the quick call, uh, Monmouth also has a couple of turf stakes for the three-year-old fillies and males. And um, the My Frenchman, which was the counterpart to the quick call, that one got rained off the turf as well and we saw another big speed figure get earned in this race by sweet cherry pie a horse who um had plenty of dirt form coming in here and uh did handle the sloppy track that we saw at monmouth on sunday throw that for sure 120 time form u.s speed figure uh he's a horse who has run some fast numbers in the past he had run a 118 when second to the very promising saudi crown uh, back at Churchill on Preakness weekend. So there's definitely some talent there. And the horse he beat in second, Super Chow, he's been a stakes competitor uh, all year, mostly in Florida, done some good running. So uh, he beat a pretty solid horse in, in that win and beat him easily. You do have to wonder how much the, um, the off track helped him in here to that big speed figure, but good solid effort. I, I would imagine better stakes are in his future. Yeah, it's a really solid speed figure, uh, whereas Uncashed got that uh, pace downgrade, pace upgrade for Sweet Cherry Pie due to the fast pace of this race and the fact that he was attacking it around the far turn. So really nice effort from him. Um, you know, I, I didn't look up the initial PPs of this race. I can't uh, say whether or not he was entered for the turf. I imagine that he was, but uh, he feels like one that, you know, the connections couldn't have been upset that this race came off the turf and probably one that has more dirt in his future. Yeah, he was entered uh, on the turf. Super Chow was the only M2O. Uh, so he was probably happy, Super Chow, the connections that it was rained off, but just ran into a, a better horse on this day. And then at Monmouth on Friday, uh, we saw an allowance race that uh, came up with some quality, including Ben Avengo, who had shown ability as a three-year-old, was coming back for his four-year-old debut here, cutting back to six furlongs, despite having most of his success going route distances last year, but really had no trouble with the cutback. This was actually a race that I got to see live as I, I took a trip to Monmouth on a Friday afternoon to take in some of the action there, and uh, wasn't expecting to see one of the races that we discuss on the page cast but boy Benavango came through with a big effort it and what's interesting he has had some success routing uh he actually led the haskell for a while last year before dropping out but he has won stakes around two turns at pimlico uh but he's also undefeated sprinting uh he won his first two sprinting then then took the route method um and maybe that's what he's best at i mean he's a horse there's always better money in the routes if you can do it but he seems a little distance challenged to me unless he meets a little comp uh, a little weaker competition. But sprinting, he just looks like a powerhouse. He he just powered away in this field. He ran a 122 time form US speed figure. And he did it in a race where the pace was solid, I would say. Um, but he was last in the field. It wasn't like it was a fast pace. And he actually finished the race so fast that the uh the half mile fraction is coded as blue because mostly because of him and how he drew away from the rest of the horses. Yeah, th this was a really impressive effort, as you said. I mean, he was he was w away with the field in terms of the break, but just lacked some speed in that opening quarter. But uh, his rider, Isaac Casillo, didn't seem to have any problem letting him drop back to last. And he just confidently moved this horse to the outside around the far turn, looped the field in the blink of an eye to take the lead at the quarter pole. And as you said, really drew off with authority. I think he can handle longer distances. Um, he has that versatility. What's his best distance? I think 
it's hard to say. Um, but uh, definitely the fact that he ran so well sprinting, it gives his uh, connections some options moving forward. And nice to see some lower profile connections have a good horse like this because he's one that definitely seems like he should be a factor in stakes races down the line. And we'll move on to Laurel, where they ran a pair of turf stakes races on their Saturday card. Uh, the Prince George's County for the males and the Big Dreyfus for the females. Um, the Prince George's County, Craig, uh, featured a smaller field. There was a heavy favorite in this race in Royal Patronage going out for Graham Motion. That one disappointed, uh, seemed to have some trouble maintaining the pace that he set. But it was Eons who had kind of, you know, been a little disappointing starting off his seven-year-old campaign, but certainly got back on track here he did get back in the form ran a 120 time form u.s speed figure something we've seen uh him do before but as you mentioned it's been a while uh, i do think he got kind of a nice pace set up a couple of the fractions are coated in red he was off that pace in just a five force field he was back and forth but he um you know, was he made a move into it early and was able to just maintain it all the way to the wire, uh, wearing down Palo Alto, uh, getting up to beat that horse by a nose. So good, strong effort by him. Uh, not sure he's one. I mean, that's a grade three type speed figure, maybe grade two if you catch a weak field. But he's just it's good to see a seven year old get back in the form. And on the turf, you never know. Uh, they can hold it for quite a while once they find it. And it's kind of a weird situation for these two races at Laurel on Saturday. Uh, you had to give the P notation to both of them um, in terms of making the speed figures. And it, sort of for different reasons, uh, the pace downgrade for Eons in the Prince George's County and then the pace upgrade for uh, Sparkle Blue, the winner of the Big Dreyfus. And I imagine you don't really want to do that. Uh, you know, you, you want to be able to compare these races and giving them the P designation kind of, you know, says to the, you know, the handicap that, you know, the races you can't really group together, but the paces of these two races were so wildly different. And I think that's why the performance of Spy Sparkle Blue in the Big Dreyfus was arguably more impressive than uh, the race for the males. Yeah, this one actually got a big uh, pace upgrade from a 107 final time all the way up to a 122. But I think it was well-deserved in this case. Uh, it isn't an ideal situation speed figure wise, but... You couldn't really rate the. There was no way to rate the gate races together, given how divergent the the paces were from each other. But um, just a good strong effort by her to get that 122. Uh, she was basically mid pack in the field, uh, you know, kind of stuck in behind, behind. But she made a big sweeping move to to take command and was able to pull away late. So I liked what I saw from her. Uh, the horse she had beat that she wound up beating was even further back than her atomic bond she wound up with a 120 and then uh, even though the third place finisher was only uh three and three quarter lengths back it was about 11 points lower than the winner because of that pace situation yeah, she was a really impressive winner of this race. The way that she lengthened her stride through the stretch to pull clear by open lengths, uh, it's the way you want to see a horse finishing. Uh, and she had shown some talent as a three-year-old, um, maybe hadn't been in the best spot so far this year, caught a tough field in the modesty. They tried a mile and a half with her last time, but it seemed like getting back to a conventional route distance really suited her. And as you said, the runner-up, I mean, she was also caught behind that slow pace, had to wait for room and upper stretch, Atomic Blonde, but uh, she finished well for second, but but it felt like the kind of result where nobody was beating Sparkle Blue on this day. Let's move on to Woodbine to wrap up the show this week. We'll discuss a couple of stakes races there from last weekend, both for the two-year-olds. And, uh, you know, one of these races was carded uh, for males, one for open sex. But actually, both of these races were won by fillies. Uh, the one that was uh, restricted to the females with the My Dear was won by uh, Living Magic, uh, shipping up uh, from the United States for Phil Schoenthal, a, a horse that uh, had run at Belmont in the Astoria. Uh, that was a, a slower race, hadn't really, uh, you know, been able to make much of an impact in that spot. But I remember when I handicapped that race, I kind of made the mental note, this is not a dirt horse. Uh, she's one that probably wants turf or synthetic. And she took a big step forward getting on Woodbine's Tapita surface. She did. I think she had ran in the 50s last time on the dirt. Uh, she jumped all the way up to what I'm guessing is going to be about a 95 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, I don't have the official figures yet. I'll, I'll get those posted either later on Tuesday or early Wednesday. 
But yeah, it was a, a good effort from her. Clearly showed your thinking that she wasn't a dirt horse. Looked like a, a whole different animal on this surface. And I would imagine they'll either keep her at Woodbine and run on the synthetic or find some turf races for her in the future. Yeah, this filly's got a nice pedigree. She's by Justify. Her dam was a millionaire running primarily on the turf and synthetic. Uh, so, I mean, there's a real future for this one. Um, she showed improved speed in this race uh, with the blinker. So all, all good signs for living magic. Um, and you know, she actually ran a slightly higher speed figure than the filly that beat the males on Sunday in the Victoria Stakes. Uh, it was just a four horse field. And, uh, you know, Pippet was coming into the race as a maiden. She broke her maiden in this uh, stakes field. Um, I certainly liked the way that she did it, though, Craig. Yeah, she looked good. She she won easily in this spot. Uh, I, like you, I would question if this was even as strong as the Philly race. Uh, the speed figure is going to come back. I'm guessing now. I don't have these officially, but I think it's going to be about a 93. Uh, both were run on pretty quick tapita surfaces on Saturday and Sunday with similar variants. So uh, I think the figures, they look pretty easy to make to me, but she was pulling away from them late. So she certainly had no trouble with this group. Yeah, I guess the one caveat is that the horse that beat her on debut actually ran in the My Dear and I believe finished sixth in that race. Uh, not really competitive. So uh, you wonder a little bit about the form of these two races, uh, but uh, it did feel like Pippet took a big step forward in her second start. And, you know, typically we wouldn't discuss these races from Woodbine, but they earned similar speed figures to some of the races that we just mentioned from Saratoga. So uh, felt like it might be worth throwing them on the rundown this week. Well, Craig, uh, that's all the racing to recap for this week's show. Uh, but as we said at the top, a lot to look forward to on the racing calendar for the rest of July. I believe they'll be drawing the Haskell this Wednesday. And it seems like the field is still in flux uh, as of the time we're recording this. I don't think we've gotten the final word yet on whether Kentucky Derby winner Mage will be in the entries for that race, although he's listed as one of the probables. I think the connections are going to make that call. But Arabian Lion expected to ship in for Bob Baffert. So, you know, Maybe we'll consider doing the Haskell card for the forecast this week. I guess we'll weigh that against Saratoga and see how they both come up. Yeah, I haven't looked ahead. It's so busy this time of year. I just wait for the PPs to come out. I don't pay too much attention to the probables. I am looking forward to that Haskell card, though. It always has a big field. And yeah, we'll just have to see how the races look. But that would certainly be the leader in the clubhouse, I would imagine. Well, everybody, thanks for tuning in to the PaceCast this week. Remember, you can always catch these podcasts on DRF.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel. Again, thanks for tuning in and make sure to catch that Time Form US forecast coming up later in the week.